What's up YouTube? This is Dennis Panuta for tutorials.eu. This is part three of the C Sharp technical job interview preparation video series. And you have hopefully seen part one and two before checking this one out. So basically checking those five videos out was definitely going to prepare you quite well for such an interview with a bunch of good questions that might come up during your job interview. All right, so I'd say let's dive right into it. All right, so let's get started. 21, what is the difference between string and string builder in C Sharp? And by the way, you can check out the complete article that this video is based on, on my blog. You can find the link in the description below. And also, please don't forget to hit that like button and become a subscriber because, well, 70% of my viewers are not subscribed yet. So maybe you're one of them. And if you are, then please consider subscribing. All right, so what is the difference? Well, a string is an immutable object. So when we have to do some actions to change a string or append a new string, it clears out the old value of the string object and it creates a new instance in memory to hold the new value in a string object. And this is consuming uh, some energy or it takes quite some time to do that, even though it's still super fast in comparison. But what you can see here is, we create this string val, which says hello, and then we add something to the val variable, which is world. So now it's going to say hello world, but this creates a new instance of the string. So if we run that, it's going to say hello world without an empty space in between. Now let's look at the string builder. In order to use the string builder, you need to make sure that you're adding system.text. So this namespace is required for your string builder to work. And then what you can do is you can append something to the string builder. Question number 22, explain the continue and break statement, even though that's not the question, but still they might uh, put it in a question format. So basically what we have here is a for loop, which iterates from zero to five. So we have this if statement here inside of this for loop, which checks if i is equal to three, and if that's the case, then it's going to break. Otherwise, it's generally going to run this right line statement, the number is, and then it's going to request us to enter a value or it's going to read the line so we can actively test it. Okay, so this break statement will break out of the loop, which means it will jump out of this for loop and it will go all the way here so control will jump here after the break statement. So this of course is obvious, it's very simple. We are generating this break by ourselves, but maybe this if statement gets data from the database and if a certain condition is met, then it will break out of the loop and it will not be a stupid loop as this one is. But let's just execute this and test it. So number is zero, I'm pressing enter, number is one, pressing enter, number is two, and then it jumps out of the loop and as you can see, we're out of the loop and the execution is done. So basically it never passed this point of i being three. It didn't even execute the number is three because it broke out of this for loop. All right, now let's do the same thing with continue. So now we use continue instead of break and it will skip the single iteration, which means it will not execute whatever comes after continue inside of this for loop, at least for that one iteration. So it will not execute the number is three, but it will jump to the number is four directly. Let's test this. The number is zero, the number is one, number is two, and you see the number is four and then five. And that's it. So break jumps out of the for loop and continue jumps out of the current iteration of the for loop. And this counts for loops in general. It's not just the case for for loops. You can also break out of the execution of the current function. Number 23, what are boxing and unboxing? Well, the conversion of value type data types to reference types, so object data types, is called boxing. So what we have here is 
we have this integer i being 10, and then we create an object called o, and we use the i value for that object. So this is the concept of boxing. So basically we're boxing in our integer into this object o. So we're changing it from a value type to a reference type. So this is a value type and this is a reference type. All right, now what is unboxing? Well, unboxing is the opposite of boxing. So basically we have this object O, which is an integer, or which holds an integer, and we convert it into an integer itself. So we convert O, the value that is inside of our object, into an integer, and that is called unboxing. Quick pause. In this video, you'll learn something about C-sharp. And if you want to learn everything there is to know that you need for the fundamentals and to become a real C-sharp developer, then definitely check out my C-sharp masterclass in which you're going to learn all of the things you need to know about C-sharp. So you're gonna learn how to do the basics, how to use object-oriented programming, how to use WPF in order to create your own user interfaces, how to use databases, how to use link, how to create your own games using Unity, and a lot more. So if you want to become a real C-sharp developer, definitely check out the link in the description below. Number 24, what is a sealed class? Well, we use the sealed keyword, as you can see here, before the class keyword, to create a sealed class. So classes are created as sealed classes when there is no need to inherit this class further or when there is a need to restrict the class from being inherited. So in this case, we cannot inherit from our class my class so if i now create a new class here public class my class 2 which tries to inherit from my class you will see that you get an error here my class 2 cannot derive from sealed type my class so basically we're saying i never want to allow an inheritance of my my class number 25 what is a partial class well, there is a feature in the C-sharp language to divide a single class file into multiple physical files. So to achieve this, we have to use the partial keyword and at compile time, it is logically one file only. So we cannot have a method with the same name or variable with the same name into different partial class files. And this concept is highly used when using WPF in order to create graphical user interfaces in C-sharp using XAML. And well, we are going to use WPF on this channel in the next few videos. So definitely hit that subscribe button to not miss out on that topic. Number 26, what is enum? Well, in C-sharp, the enum keyword is used to declare an enumeration. So an enum is a value type. It is a collection of related named constants referred to as enumerator list. An enum type can be any of these, integer, float, double, and byte. However, to use it beside int, explicitly casting is required. So to create a numeric constant in the .NET framework, enum is used. All the members of the enum are of the enum type and there must be a numeric value for each enum type. So basically we have this enum here, as you can see, it's called day, and this could be called day of the week, for example. So we have Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so forth, and we can now access them directly here. So I can just say day dot, and I will get those different values. And you can also see that they're assigned a number. So Friday is, for example, number six, which means that Saturday will probably be number zero. So you can see day sat is assigned zero, so it starts at zero and it goes all the way up to however many entries you have here. So you can also see that int is the default type of the enumeration element, and by the default, the first enumerator has the value of zero, and well, each successive enumerator is then increased by one. Number 27, what is dependency injection and how can it be achieved? Well, dependency injection is a design pattern. Here, instead of creating an object of a class in another class, so a dependent class, directly, we are passing the object as an argument in the constructor of the dependent class. It helps to write loosely coupled code and helps to make the code more modular and easy to test. And there are three ways to achieve dependency injection. So constructor injection, this is the most commonly used injection type. 
in constructor injection, we can pass the dependency into the constructor. We have to make sure that we do not have a default constructor here and the only constructor should be a parameterized constructor. Then we have property injection. There are cases when we need the default constructor of a class. So in that case, we can use property injection. And then finally, method injection. In method injection, we need to pass the dependency in the method only. When the entire class does not require the dependency, there is no need to implement constructor injection. When we have a dependency on multiple objects, then instead of passing the dependency in the constructor, we pass the dependency in the function itself where it is required. Number 28, the using statement. The keyword using is used to define the scope of the resources used in that using statement block. All the resources used inside the using code block get disposed of once the code block completes execution. So I have this class called book and it inherits from the iDisposable interface, provides a mechanism for releasing unmanaged resources. And we need that for our using keyword that we use here. So basically I have this class book, which has a name and a price and I can create an object of it. And there I need to enter the name and price in the constructor. And right, and then I can just print something. In this case, I'm just gonna print the name and the price of the object and I can dispose. And as you can see, I've not implemented the dispose functionality. That's something that you could do then as well. And then we have this class student where the students do something and we are using this using keyword here to create a new book object with a name and a price. And then we just use the print statement. And once that is done, the dispose function will be called. Now, in order to understand this a little better, I have this static void main, well, a starting point for my class, and I create a student called class one, and I do something. So I call this do something method, which uses this using keyword in order to print the book, okay? And now I have also implemented a dispose functionality, which basically just says disposing of book. And if I run this, you will see that it executes this print statement here, book name is and price is, it says book name is book name and price is 1245. And then it's disposing of book. So that's basically what this dispose method now will do. And it will dispose of that object. All right, and that's it. Number 29, what are the access modifiers of C-sharp? Explain each type. So access modifiers are keywords used to provide accessibility to class members or functions. Below are its types. So you can see here, there is the public keyword, an object or a member or a function can be accessed anywhere without any restriction. With a protected keyword, the access is limited up to the class which inherits this class. Then we have internal, which can only be accessed within the current assembly. And then we have private, cannot be accessed outside of this class. Number 30, what are delegates? Delegates are like function pointers. It is a reference data type that holds the reference of a method. We use delegates to write generic type safe functions. All delegates derive from the class system.delegate. A delegate can be declared using the delegate keyword followed by a function signature as shown below. So you can see we create a delegate here. I'm gonna call this one print and it requires a value. You can see we create a print delegate here. So this is basically our delegate declaration. And then we can use the delegate in order to point to functions. So here we are pointing to print number. So and then at this point, we can just use printdel as if it was print number. So we can just pass an integer value here and we can pass another integer value here and call the function once again and so forth. So we are calling this print delegate, which in turn has print number assigned to it at that point. So it points to print number at this point. And then we can basically change whatever it's pointing to throughout our execution. So you can see here, now the print delegate will point to print money, which is this function here. So it's a different function. It also requires an integer that's important because we defined it here. We said it will work with integers 
And that's why we can use it for those two functions because they both require an integer as their parameter. So we can just assign print money instead of print number here at this point. So it now is going to point towards print money and we can use print del again, but now it's not going to execute number so-and-so, but it's going to execute money so-and-so, or it's going to display money so-and-so. So let's run this just to see what it actually does. And as you can see, it says number, number. So number 100,000, number 200, and then it says money 10,000 and money 200. So let's look at some of the characteristics of delegates. Delegates derive from the system.delegate class, as I said. They have a signature as well as a return type. So in our case, the return type is void, but a delegate needs to have a return type. And a function assigned to delegates must fit with the signature. So as I said, it must fit this integer signature, which it does in this case and in this case as well. Delegates can point to instance methods or even static methods. Delegate objects, once created, can dynamically invoke the methods it points to at runtime. And delegates can call methods synchronously and asynchronously. And delegates are quite used in WPF. So for example, when you're using WPF to create your user interfaces, you are going to definitely have to learn more about delegates. All right, so that's it for part three of the job interview preparation questions for your C-sharp interview. Definitely hit that like button if you liked it and if it helped you to prepare yourself for the job interview that's ahead of you. And I wish you all the best for your job interview and definitely check out part four, which is gonna come in a week or is going to be added as a card. All right, so all the best and see you in the next video.